All right. Well, um, yeah. So thanks everyone who's joined so far. I expect a few more people will trickle in as, as we get started, but um, thanks for joining. Um, if you have questions, maybe I think we have a fair bit of time at the end for questions. So you might just want to hold on to them until the end. Um, and then you can either do it in the chat or put up your hand and, uh, and I'll unmute you and you can ask a question and I'll try and just like go in the order of the people ask, but it'd be great to have a discussion afterward. So I'm happy to introduce uh, Professor Katja Mombar, who is a professor at the University of Waterloo in systems design and mechanical and mechatronics. Uh, and she's a Canada Excellence Research Chair who joined us about a year ago or a little over a year ago. Um, and so prior to that, she was a professor at Heidelberg University in Germany. Um, and she's done a lot of interesting work in, I guess, uh, human-centered robots and optimization-based techniques for robots and biomechanics. Um, and so I guess I will say thanks a lot for joining and maybe uh, you can take it from here. Thank you very much, um, Stephen. Yeah, good, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, really my pleasure to, to be here and um, speak in the Waterloo AI seminar and um, yeah, tell you a bit about embodied intelligence for human-centered robots. Um, so as um, Stephen mentioned, I um, actually just joined Waterloo um, a bit more than a year ago. So just before the pandemic started, I came from Heidelberg University in Germany. And actually, I was already scheduled to, to speak in this seminar um, in April last year, but I think it was one of the first um, talks that was canceled. Yeah, so I'm really glad we can repeat that um, right now. So um, with, even though there was a pandemic since I have been in, in Waterloo, I um, managed to, to build up a really nice and motivated team. Actually, a few of our latest students are, are missing in this um, collection of pictures. Um, but yeah, we, we managed to, to work together um, through a lot of online meetings, but um, yeah, but also um, were luckily allowed since last summer to, to go back to our labs. Um, I also would like to introduce my, my previous group to you. So this is um, the, the group um, in Heidelberg. So a, a while ago, many of those people are, are still around. Um, I'm still working with them closely. Um, and also today I will be showing you um, some of the research results from my new team in, in Waterloo, but also from the um, from the previous one in Heidelberg. So this is why I'm introducing that to you. Okay, so um, my talk is about um, human-centered robots. So I would quickly like to um, say what I mean by that. So for me, um, human-centered robots are robots that um, closely work with the humans, that somehow support humans in their actions and motions, um, or that perform human-like tasks. And um, as you probably know, but also we'll see in that talk, human-centered robots may take very different um, shapes. So um, the vision is that um, human-centered robots can, um, can support uh, and facilitate people's lives in, in many areas. So um, the idea is that Robots can replace humans in dangerous, remote, or monotonous tasks, such as um, disaster recovery, work in space, or also um, very monotonous tasks in airline and ship manufacturing. Um, there also has been a, um, a new kind of dangerous task, and these are um, applications that um, come from the pandemic. So um, in the past year, we also have seen that um, things that usually people like to do, um, take care of other people or um, perform tests with them um, might put them in the danger. So the idea is also that robots might in the future help with um, care and nursing tasks, um, also medical testing and anamnesis tasks in critical situations such as the, the COVID pandemic. Um, there's also, 
Yeah, so, so what we see here is actually um, all kinds of situations from very remote standalone tasks, such as um, the work in space, to also very close interactions in, uh, with humans. Um, the other area where um, human-centered robots can support and um, really make people's lives much, much better is um, that they can enhance human mobility and also human well-being and support humans in, in many different ways and help them to, to lead an independent life. So that involves um, things that um, some people might not even call robots, but which are clearly robotic technology. So that involves um, prosthesis, exoskeletons, um, but also external assistive devices. Um, that also involves um, robots that somehow um, support people in their daily life, like for example, in the, in the household with um, a lot of tasks. So as you may imagine, this is results in very individual requirements on um, the robots for, for each of these different cases, also for each of the different mobility assistance um, devices we, we see here. Um, so that um, means that human-centered robots have to um, very intelligently sense and interact with the world around them. So they have to interact with the humans, they have to learn how to collaborate with humans, they have to um, assist or support the human movement and also in this case, um, or in all cases, predict the consequences of their actions. They have to um, explore unknown environments, might be um, unknown to them or very unknown to, to everyone. Um, and they also have to interact with that environment. So for this, um, for, for these tasks, um, human-centered robots need um, a very specific kind of intelligence. So um, of course they need um, artificial intelligence in the, in the more classical sense, um, depending on the particular task they are performing. So they have to um, yeah, need that kind of knowledge. For example, if they do medical testing, they need um, knowledge in the, in the test they are performing. Um, they need to know how they manufacture something. Um, uh, so that they can take um, decisions in a more or less autonomous way. But in addition, so, so this is the, the specific part and that's, that's really more classical AI. But in addition, they need um, motion intelligence. So this is the ability to perceive the environment and also their human interaction partners. Um, they need a lot of cognitive skill to understand what, what they see and um, then take the decisions about the, the action, the interaction with the environment and the human. They also um, need um, prediction ability and anticipation ability. Um, and then this is um, very um, central, they need um, motion ability. So they need, they need to be strong enough, fast enough, um, but also efficient and um, stable, which is one of the core um, difficulties, um, enough to perform the motion they, they have to perform and also to, to stabilize the human they are interacting with. Um, and then they need to be uh, able to interact. So they have to interact with the humans and the environment in a safe, reliable, but also predictable way. And um, this is what we summarize under the term motion intelligence or embodied intelligence and which um, goes beyond um, more classical artificial intelligence. So um, coming to the goals of my talk, I want to give you an overview of our research on, on human-centered robots. I um, then would like to explain a bit more the challenges of endowing these robots with um, embodied intelligence or emotion intelligence. Um, um, then I want to um, talk about our um, the methods we are using and the algorithms um, we have developed to um, tackle um, these um, problems. And um, yeah, I also would like to use that um, talk to um, seek if there's any any opportunity to collaborate with you um, within Waterloo AI. So maybe anyone is interested in also contributing to, to our research in, in human-centered robots. So um, why is motion intelligence um, such a challenge, especially for, for human-like systems? So the problem is that the motion of the system itself is hard. Um, we are looking at a system which is, which is highly complex um, with many degrees of freedom. 
Um, it is um, redundant with respect to movement tasks, meaning um, there's many different possibilities to, to take a step forward or to, to interact with a human or to, to reach to a, to a certain goal. Um, but there's um, some that are more um, suitable to, to the situation than, than others. Um, the system is under-actuated, meaning um, on the one hand, we can actuate many joints, but there's also degrees of freedom um, which are not directly actuated, so, such as um, the direct um, forward motion of the system, so moving the system as a whole forward or um, rotating um, the, the system as a whole. Um, there's no direct motor or direct um, muscle that um, drives that motion, but that is a, is a motion that is produced by um, the very complex interaction of, of many other um, actuators. Um, stability control is um, very complex. So if we're looking at um, a biped human or robot or also a human, um, it, it's very easy for them to, to fall down if they are not doing the right thing. And I'm sure all of you have already seen um, videos of, of falling robots. Um, it's also that, that motions get easily infeasible. So um, there's um, easily combinations of, of joint motions or of um, that cannot be performed by, by the robot. So, um, okay, so what we um, think, um, what we need, I uh, think is um, efficient models and algorithms for motion optimization, learning and control. So we need efficient approaches that help us um, find um, suitable motions for these robots and, and control them. So in that um, context, learning motions from scratch, like, um, yeah, like in other contexts, is, it's usually not possible um, because um, it would damage the robots and um, also the humans in the loop. So it's not possible that we just let the robots learn and um, explore the entire uh, space because um, the models are way too complex and then also the, the robot would, would fall and or fall on a human and then, then um, destroy everything. Um, but instead, um, we think we should um, exploit the models of the underlying physics, um, which helps us to find feasible motions and also motion ranges. And um, as I will show you in a few examples, um, we think that combining model-free and model-based method will be the, the direction to go. Um, so coming to an overview of um, the research of my chair, I like to structure that in, in four different areas. So first of all, we are really interested in understanding human movement, um, analyzing it and improving it for the human movement um, itself, um, because there's also many different interesting applications, but also um, for, um, as a prerequisite for working on human-centered robots. Um, second area is um, the design and control of variable robots and assistive devices, um, so exoskeletons, um, uh, prosthesis, but also external assistive devices. Um, we also work on the design and control of humanoid robots. Um, all of these three areas are, of course, um, very much connected because, as mentioned, we need um, to understand human movement to um, to develop assistive systems for, for them, but also um, if we want to mimic um, human behavior with humanoid robots or also um, have humanoid robots collaborating with humans, it's also very important that we um, know about human movement. Um, as a fourth area, we are working on efficient models and algorithms for simulation optimization and control, which is used in all the three other areas. Okay, so I will, um, yeah, that um, combines um, theory, experiments, but also computational methods. So I will now a little bit, uh, just quickly um, talk about um, human motion analysis and improvement, because um, I think it's maybe not the, um, the most important um, field um, for, for you. So I will just quickly mention some things we are doing, but then also come back to it later in the, in the robotics um, topics. 
Um, so here's an overview of some of the experiments we have been doing in the past. So looking at um, a lot of um, walking motions, um, everyday motions like um, lifting and um, bending, um, sit to stand, but also um, yeah, looking at um, how people react to, to perturbations. Um, and we have been doing many experiments with um, yeah, different age groups. Um, to just mention some recent examples on the, on the human motion side, um, for example, have we been studying um, the role of symmetry and asymmetry and also optimality principles in running motions of amputees and non-amputee um, athletes. Um, we have been looking at um, balance properties um, in very challenging situations in sports, for example, at um, in slackline athletes and also evaluated how, how trainings, training affects their um, way of balancing. Um, and then we also have performed studies on um, the biomechanics and balance in um, patients, for example, um, patients with uh, schizophrenia and looked at, at walking motions, but also a bit more challenging um, yeah, one-legged standing and tandem walk, so also balancing situations. Um, for the study of human motions, we, um, and that's also something we translate to, to, the, to the robotic project, um, here we are using um, advanced biomechanical models. Um, that includes on the one side the, the whole body dynamics of, um, of human movement, um, so looking at the at really the, the underlying mechanics and, and physics. Um, these um, models always have to be adjusted to um, the specific subjects or subject groups we are looking at. So um, tuning the geometry, the masses, everything um, either to um, anthropomorphic tables or um, a specific subject used in a, in a measurement. And in, um, in quite a few projects, we are also um, using descriptions of the muscles um, as in form of muscle torque generators. So we are trying to capture the, the underlying physics of so the mechanics, but also the, the torque um, generation um, quite, quite explicitly and quite precisely. Um, we also use optimization in the study of human motion and that also translates to, to, the, to the robotics topics. Um, and there's um, three different contexts in which we are using it. One is for, for motion reconstruction. So optimization helps us to, to give a really detailed analysis of, of a recorded human motions by, by means of like by, by adding the information we get from the model. And then we can extract much more information from the data than we actually measured. Um, we also use model for um, predictive motion generation. Um, using an optimality criterion, we are thinking um, is, is a good one for the for the motion. So we will, can predict what a motion looks like under different conditions. And um, as a third problem, we are looking at inverse optimal control. So for um, understanding optimality in human movement. So we are assuming a motion we have observed is optimal. And then we are trying to find out what criterion has been optimized in this situation. So this is um, on the learning side, that's related to, to inverse reinforcement learning, in case anyone is working in that area. Okay, but just to mention that, um, that's roughly the methods and we are using, but we will come back to that in, the, in relation to, to robots. So now I will start um, talking about our research on humanoid robots and human-robot interaction. Um, so, um, we are, or we have been, we are and have been using a number of platforms. So um, first of all, but also lastly, the, um, the new REMC at the University of Waterloo that we just got. Um, we also have been working with another REMC, um, which we had at Heidelberg University, which you got in the context of a project. Um, and um, previously we have been working with a, with a high cup robot um, and even before that, with a, with a Japanese robot called HRP2, um, which was available at our um, French partner last year in ASS um, lab. 
So in the future, we also want to do more um, work with a, with a Talos robot that already is in Waterloo since, um, since quite some time. But um, yeah, and especially if we want to exploit the, the great opportunity we have in Waterloo to have um, two full-size um, humanoid robots and um, do some collaborative research between, between these two robot, uh, ro robot, robot collaboration. But that's still um, future plans. So coming to our robot, um, RIMC, which um, we actually just termed um, called seven. So we just um, baptized it. Um, that robot came to us last summer and it comes from, from Spain, was produced by a company called um, PAL Robotics, same company that also um, produced the Talos. And it is also a full-size humanoid robot, um, a bit um, weaker and a bit better for, uh, weaker than Talos, um, and therefore a bit more suited for um, human robot interactions. And it also has a different control principle than, than Talos. So yeah, it already came with a little bit of functionality like um, standard walking, but of course we want to teach it to do uh, more things than that. So um, the goal is here to um, teach it to move on, on different terrain but also in general to establish benchmarking criteria and evaluation criteria for, for robots that um, help us to um, determine if a particular robot is good for a, a real life application. And we are doing that in collaboration with a, with a European project called Eurobench. Um, so in order to um, generate motions for, for humanoid robots, um, we work with very um, precise models of the of the robots which um, essentially um, knows everything about the, the, the full robot um, kinematics and um, dynamic properties of all segments but um, more importantly also all limitations of joint angles velocities torques etc and also knows everything to describe um, auto collision um, but also all the um, stability related um, things that we might have to take into account for a robot. So also with this um, HFP2 robot that you just saw here, um, we use that same approach to, to generate a um, step over an obstacle, what you see here though. So that's essentially a quite, that was the largest obstacle the, this robot had ever um, come across. And here you see the, the comparison of the, the simulation in the top right and um, the real robot. And you see that the the computational model is really precisely um, predicting what the what the real robot is doing, and we that really helped us to bring the robots to its um, physical limits. Um, the problem is here, as well as in other situations, also in walking, we can we can say uh, use the, the same approach. So it um, gives us really nice results, but in all these cases, the the computation times are very high. Um, on the other hand, um, so that's the model-based optimization with this really precise model. On the other hand, um, model-free learning of the motion, as I mentioned it, just letting the robot explore that in, in real space would also take a lot of time, but it's also not an option because the, the space is huge, um, so it would, would even take much, much longer, but the robot would also be um, broken um, many times by, by, by then. So, um, the idea we had is that um, we should combine model-free and model-based methods. Um, um, so we, the, uh, what we wanted to do is combine um, the optimization approach we had been using with um, learning and also motion primitives, which is a very um, popular approach in robotics, essentially um, having some elementary um, functions that can um, help to assemble a new robot motion, but these motion primitives can have all kinds of, of different sources. And um, yeah, so our approach, which we call Kokomopil for combining optimal control movement primitives and um, learning essentially um, is um, yeah, generating motion primitives in, in a very particular way. So the idea is here to, to use um, the same optimal uh, control approach that I have been describing um, before to produce training data. 
Um, so um, we have been solving many optimal control problems. And in that case, it was made for, for, for a walking example. Um, and based on these um, multiple optimal control solutions, um, mo movement primitives could be learned. So this takes quite long. Um, but we only have to do it once and it's done offline in order to produce the, the training data. Then once um, we are in the situation to want to generate a, a new motion, we can um, generate this just using the learned movement primitives um, and then this, yeah, and then put that on the, on the real robot. And that's something which is, um, is really quick. And so, so everything that has to be done online or in, in real time, um, just takes a, a few milliseconds or seconds. Um, so everything that's expensive is done as a preparation. And um, yeah, the online motion is only to find the, the weights of, of combining these different um, movement primitives. So in, in the particular example, the task the robot was had was to imagine the robot comes to a certain situation and then it has to generate um, a step sequence with um, given uh, step length. Um, and um, yeah, it should do that in a, in a talk optimal way. So what we did here um, is we um, generated training data for um, walking motions with um, different step length. Um, and then we also um, um, generated um, some motions so there was cyclic motions, but then we also um, generated a few where the steps got longer or um, shorter over the, over the cycle. Um, so it was not periodic, but um, was the, the transition steps. Um, and then based on um, essentially, I think it was 23 motions in, in total, we could um, learn the, the movement primitives. And um, with those movement primitives, we um, then could um, generate new motions, just telling the robot um, which kind of step length sequence it, it should um, um, generate. Um, this um, middle part, that's the, the idea we currently have, could also be replaced by other model-free approaches. Um, so here you see um, one of the examples or one of the results. So um, first in the, in the computer, so you see the robot is, um, yeah, it's, it's not like it's a, it's a sequence of steps with um, different length. And that's the same on the, on the real robot. So what was actually nice is even though that, that final motion is only based on the movement primitives, which directly don't know anything about the, about the robot dynamics, um, it results in, in feasible and um, even close to optimal solutions. And um, that also work well in the, in the robotic experiments. Even though you, you should know that this robot is very sensitive to, um, if you give it a motion that is not dynamically feasible, it, it usually fails. And, and that was great about that method. It, it produced feasible motions. Um, yeah, so we think there's um, a lot of possible extensions. So um, we also would like to um, evaluate the use of neural networks instead of movement primitives in this um, model-free um, segment of the, of the combined methods. Um, so um, we already did some studies for, for simpler examples to train neural networks to generate trajectories that are um, close to um, being optimal and also close to being feasible. Um, then, yeah, we'd like to test different types of neural networks, parameters and applications, um, maybe even evaluate some special hardware. Um, yeah, and um, we also think that that should be, um, yeah, applied to many of the other examples. I will show you also in the, also in the context of other human-centered robots, for example, exoskeletons or assistive devices. Um, yeah, this here is a um, completely different approach of, of generating motion. So here, um, actually, it's um, based on something um, copied from the from the human. So that's um, what we call the inverse optimal control approach. I'm not talking about that here specifically. But the, the general idea is that we perform um, human experiments. And then um, from, from the human movement, here, here it's based on a, on a quite simple model, a template model of the human. We are trying to um, extract um, general um, laws of the human movement. So 
essentially we are trying to extract what kind of optimization functions um, humans are, are using for generating their emotions. Um, here it was done on a, on a stepstone um, scenario. Um, then we have the um, we have the objective function and then we apply it to a similar template model of the robot now with the robot dynamic parameters and then this can be um, applied to, um, to to the robot and um, corresponding whole body motions for the robot can be generated. Um, yeah so here you see the the entire sequence of um, yeah generating the um, the, the step sequence for, for the template model, um, then generating the sequence for the um, for the stimulated robot and also putting it to the to the real robot. In that case, it was the, the high cop robot um, developed at IIT. Um, yeah, also for the, the BMC robot, we think it's really important to, to have a very good model. Um, so we, we already got a model from the manufacturer, but we found that there were some, um, over the time, some, some model parameters had changed because they had changed the design. And there's also, um, even though um, the model is based on CAD information, of, there's, of course, lots of things which are not in the CAD model, like lots of cables. Um, and yeah, at least we, we notice it's, it's, not, it's not a precise model. So this here shows you um, the experiments we have been performing. So we have put the robot into many different um, configurations in order to improve um, the estimates. And, and we have um, yeah, measured in a motion capture lab the, the kinematics as well as the, um, the center of pressure. So here it's standing on, on force plates. Um, and, and that helped us to identify the the segment masses as well as the um, center of mass locations for all the all the segments and um, yeah with that um, we, we got a much better model as I can show you in a second um, yeah so here um, I start by showing you a few of the benchmarks we are developing so as I mentioned we on the one hand want to improve motions but then also um, develop benchmarks so here two example um, for um, climbing stairs, um, but also for um, evaluating situ stand, so standing up from, from a sitting position. So these are both, um, both benchmark setups. Um, for this um, situ stand, that's also one of the examples we um, solved by using optimal control and the, and the precise method. And the, um, this video here, now um, shows you both. So that shows you um, the, the optimized results, but it also shows a, um, a benchmark um, where the situ stand motion is um, made more complex from one situation to the next. So in the first case, um, like the, the robot is sitting at the same height all the time, but the foot, the feet are moved forward in each of the trial. Um, so you see that feet are already standing more forward and that's all dynamic optimized um, standing up motions. Here they are even further forward and here they are very much forward and you see it needs a really dynamic motion to, to stand up. And yeah, the idea is to do that as far as the robot, until the robot essentially fails. Um, and here um, the chair is, is lowered from trial to trial as you can probably see in the picture. And um, yeah, again, in each, in each of the cases, the robot is performing an optimized motion. Okay, and that, that was something which was not possible with the, with the old model. Um, okay, another benchmark we are developing is um, one for manipulation while standing. So um, yeah, grabbing a box from a shelf and putting it to another shelf. Um, or also local manipulation, which is um, yeah, taking a box or taking an object and then walking over um, a certain distance and then putting it to, to another shelf. So that's supposed to mimic situations robots would, would encounter in, yeah, in many different areas where they would be working. Um, yeah, and here we are again, working on the development of that setup and the, the definition of test beds or tests um, and also on the, on the motion generation. 
Um, stability of walking is also something very crucial um, where we have developed a test bed where the, essentially the, the steps were made um, larger in every step trial until um, the robot fails. Um, and um, yeah, we also have developed a walking over obstacles um, test bed where the robot has to climb over obstacles of, of different types, but also of different height, as you can see here in the picture. Um, we also um, have thought about how to um, make the robot move over um, large distances and also um, very different terrains. So here um, you see as an example, a very steep um, hill um, um, with, with a rough terrain. Um, and on the other hand, also piles of, of really big obstacles that the robot should go over. So the idea was to put the robot on something mobile like a like a Segway. So that's what yeah, one of my students is currently working on. Um, the way we do that is um, again, we, we learn from human movement. So we are um, we started doing motion capture experiments of, of humans on the on the Segway, um, which allows us to do a detailed biomechanical analysis, also identify how the how the Segway is um, reacting to the to the human actions and also identify the Segway controller. Um, and um, yeah, using using these models, um, then we take that and um, put it to the to the simulator together with a with a robot model, and then um, in the end um, put it to the to the real robot. Um, Another really important thing um, in many of the applications we are looking at is um, what we call physical, social, human, robot interaction. So um, the background is that um, yeah, close physical human robot interactions over really long periods of time is, um, is important in many cases. Um, so that means um, human and robots really have to touch each other for a very long time, or the robot has to directly act um, on the human, like the mobility assistance system, or collaborate hand in hand with the human over a very long time. And um, the big question is, what does it take for humans to allow robots to, to get close to them and also to, to remain in that close contact? So, um, I mean, here you see me with the Ream C, but the Ream C is switched off, so this is not a problem. But if it um, performs actions, of course, it gets. Um, it gets riskier and it should work out. So, um, sorry. Um, yeah, so on the one hand, we have the physical human robot interaction um, problems. So um, the robot should um, achieve the tasks um, in a way that is safe for the human, um, but also the social side that perform the task um, that is accepted by humans. And that also makes them feel comfortable, which um, not necessarily everything that is safe also, also does so that. Um, yeah, combines these these two components. Um, so as a test case for that, we have um, for that physical, social, human, robot interaction, we have identified um, ballroom dancing. Um, so where um, humans are in contact all the time, and also the way how um, the robot would approach a human, um, and also how how it moves um, should play a role in how the how the human feels about it. So um, in this case, the robot requires additional sensors to feel the contact with the human. So ideally, you would like to have pressure sensors at um, the hands and um, the body. So at these um, three places where human and robot touch each other. Um, we have started um, doing some first experiments. Um, yeah, just, um, sorry, with the, um, with guiding the robot through its hand because it already has um, force torque sensors. Um, so the robot um, can be pulled or pushed um, and is then um, yeah, following or following actually the, the guidance. So right now it's um, the, the humans guiding the robot, but um, in the end, we also of course would like the the robot be the guiding person and then or the guiding in the guiding role and um, then see how the how the people feel about that. 
Okay, um, where that same physical, social, human robot interaction is also very important is in medical applications. Um, so um, we are also interested in yeah, using robots for testing, but then also um, giving direct assistance to, to people. So um, all these cases that are close um, interaction is, is required. Um, for example, to perform COVID testing, um, that is um, something where if, if, a, if we use the robot for, for COVID testing, um, we, um, yeah, the, the humans would have to let the robot really close. Um, so in order to be able to do that, we um, plan to perform or to really understand how that works. We have already looked at a lot of literature, um, but we will also perform biomechanical tests with nurses. Um, when we are allowed to, to do that again. Um, we want to um, look at parametric modeling of the um, nasal cavity and have a, have a full simulator that can, um, yeah, that, that, um, yeah, can plan the, the intuition of the swap into, into the nose. Um, we're looking at different image processing techniques um, and then um, yeah, are developing safe controllers um, so that the robot is um, correctly inserting the, the swap. Um, for this, we are of course then not going directly to test that on, on humans, but um, we start by testing that on, on nasal phantoms for, um, uh, yeah, for, for testing the robot skills in, in that environment first, which is the step after the, the simulation. Okay, so now coming, um, shifting from, from humanoids to, to wearable robots, so to exoskeletons, prosthesis, and um, mobility assistance devices. Um, in that case, um, the, the common goal for all these systems is to, um, yeah, that we want to find out how these assistive devices have to be designed and how do they have to be controlled in order to best support the, the respective human movement. So they can be made for very different um, deficiencies in mobility, but in each case, they have to individually provide the, the best possible support. Um, yeah, we did quite a lot of work in, in this area, um, looking at um, prosthesis in sports and also everyday life. Um, mobility assistant robots, um, then also different kinds of exoskeletons and functional electrical stimulations. So the um, three things I will be talking about here is spinal exoskeletons, um, assistive devices, and also um, lower limb exoskeletons. Um, yeah, and in all these cases, again, um, a human model is, is important um, yeah, for, for the development of these devices. Um, so starting with the, with the spinal exoskeleton, the idea is that, um, or the, the motivation is that many working activities are very damaging to the lower back. So people have to um, carry heavy loads or spend a lot of time in very uncomfortable position and um, get back pain from that. And so that makes back pain, one, back pain one of the leading causes for sick leaves worldwide. Um, in the EU project, project Spectrum that I was part of, we have developed um, spinal exoskeletons for prevention of back pain and, and reintegration after, after an absence. Um, yeah, there were many, so essentially we, we started from scratch and had yeah, lots, of, lots of questions to, to answer. So how to, yeah, how to design such an exoskeleton, how to control it, what kind of actuators and so so on. Um, in the end, um, the project resulted in a, in a couple of um, prototypes, many of them um, developed in, in Brussels by the VOB. Um, yeah, we also developed one um, simple prototype in my, in my previous lab, but, but in general, the um, prototypes included passive ones um, with springs, dampers, clutches, and so on, but also active um, prototypes, including actuators. And um, these exoskeletons consist of rigid elements, but also um, compliant elements like um, these bendable beams that you see in, in quite a few of them. Okay, in that case, we um, also started by doing lots of experiments for the exoskeleton design, exploring ranges of motions, um, 
but also critical motions so like like lifting heavy things lifting and um, turning and seeing how how people how different subjects behaved um, evaluating their the kinematics and, and dynamics um, so the models we have been using here were um, combined models of, of humans and exoskeletons so um, taking a whole body um, human model then um, looking at the specific areas we we wanted to consider like for example including um yeah a detailed model of the of the spine and then adding a parameterized model of the the exoskeleton and and combining them either by um, rigid coupling um fixing certain points of the exoskeleton to to certain points of the of the of the human or by formulating a um a compliant coupling between them um, we also um, found out that actually that connection between human and exoskeleton is something very important to, to consider in the model, um, because that's also where it's critical. It's not just important to have, a, to have a strong exoskeleton, but it's also really important to transmit the, the forces to the humans in a, in a very um, like comfortable way, so that um, people tolerate the interaction forces and, and are not hurt by the exoskeleton. Um, so these interaction forces are really important and we, yeah, we included them in the, in the model. Um, so now the question is, um, if we um, know how people perform motions, as you, for example, see here, you see lifting motions for um, five different people and you see that they do it in their very own style. But the question is, if we now develop exoskeletons for these people so that they are supported, how would they then perform their motion? Would they, um, would they um, maintain their motion and just, um, yeah, would they be the same or will they somehow be adjusted or optimized through the, the exoskeleton? And then another question is, um, which is more the ergonomist view is, um, why are we actually giving them exoskeletons? Shouldn't we better train people to, to use better lifting techniques in, instead of these exoskeletons? Um, we think both is important. And um, yeah, we also think that um, looking at how an exoskeleton supports when the motion stays the same and also how it, um, how it changes um, should be of interest. So that resulted for us in two different optimization problems. So the first is to determine the best exoskeleton for a given motion. We are actually tracking the, the recorded data and just adding exoskeletons to the people um, by still yeah, having them maintain their motion they had before and just optimizing the, the properties of the, of the exoskeleton. So then we found um, the best possible exoskeleton designs. What we also found in this context is how um, the exoskeletons were interacting. So the, the forces or the, the, the arrows you see here are the um, contact forces um, between the exoskeleton and the human. So, um, and what we included here is that these um, forces should be below the acceptable limits. Um, yeah, but um, the problems also, there is some data around, but the pain limits um, seem to be quite also subject specific. So again, that's something that, that could be um, put in the model in a subject specific way. Um, this is the, the other question. So if we now assume that um, we can also adjust the motion and not just um, mimic the one we had um, without exoskeleton. So here we looked at um, changing the lifting techniques um, to minimize um, the lumbar torques. And here we looked at the cumulative lumbar torques, but also the peak lumbar torques um, in the view of back pain, back pain specialists. Both of them are important. Um, what we could um, find as a, as a summary is that, um, and, and we did that then without exoskeleton and with exoskeleton. So what we found is that um, the cumulative load can be um, reduced um, by far um, if just um, the technique is optimized, so without any exoskeleton, um, but the peak loads um, can only be significantly reduced if, if we also add an exoskeleton. So I um, think for, for large, for large um, loads, it's definitely important to, to also um, work with exoskeletons. Um, so this is um, 
again, the exoskeleton that we have been developing in, in my team in, in Heidelberg. Um, the student in Heidelberg also started to evaluate that, but um, yeah, we currently have it um, on loan here in, in Waterloo and will perform um, the further experimental evaluation of the exoskeleton and also add an actuation to it because right now it's it's only um, a passive exoskeleton with this springy element in the in the back okay um coming to the next um topic of assistive technology that's on um yeah on um developing um, things for people of high age. So mobility is a, is a key factor of the quality of life for old persons. Um, but there's many things that um, yeah, reduce mobility of old persons. Um, and that's um, because people are getting older. Um, that's um, affecting more and more people. And um, the problem is that right now um, they are still supported by very um, simple devices and there's no real technologies to support their mobility. So that's really needed. Um, so in a project that we um, started in Heidelberg and that I'm still co-directing, um, we um, start developing multiple mobility robots um, for, yeah, to, to support people of um, different frailty levels. So that includes um, different exoskeletons, um, but also um, mobility assistance robots. Um, so yeah, here, of course, it's, it's really important to, to look at how old people are moving with um, support and, and without support. Of course, that's also a kind of research which is now a bit um, hindered in, in COVID times. So for the, for the past year, of course, there have been no studies with um, vulnerable population, but we did a few um, before that and, and hope to be able to continue soon. Um, so um, this mobility assistant robot we are developing for, for older adults, um, the one you see here, so that the one on the on the top left here, that's that's a commercial one called um, Lea, that's just for walking assistance. And um, the other one you see here was developed in a previous European project called called Mobot. Um, we also um, yeah, supported that by, um, by performing lots of um, simulations on how to best, um, yeah, support um, sit or stand motions with um, different kind of assistance devices. Um, the idea now is to come um, from that quite um, bulky design that we had in the previous project to a more um, lightweight, um, yeah, lightweight robot, which um, Anas, a student in Waterloo, is now developing. Um, yeah, and the idea is here to provide um, support of 25% of the weight. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, uh, support people actively um, while standing up, but also while uh, walking by powering the, the different directions. Um, yeah, we also have built um, a lab device in Heidelberg that um, is, is very big and bulky, but that allows to not just do tests in, in simulation, but to, um, to support um, to give any kind of support and then draw conclusions for the mobile devices, what um, motions best uh, to implement there. So this is just, just for the lab. Um, yeah, we also do uh, work with um, lower limb exoskeletons for um, elderly persons. So um, the one you see here is, a, is an exoskeleton developed at IIT in Italy that we purchased one for Waterloo and, and one for, for Heidelberg. Um, that's originally for spinal cord injury patients, but we want to, um, among other things, adjust it for, for elderly. Um, the goal is to achieve um, stable walking without crutches. Um, yeah, also perform some hardware extensions and um, yeah, use model-based walking controllers for, for elderly and for spinal cord injury patients. And yeah, one of the important things we discovered when doing first test with, with our um, grad students is um, yeah, that it's also um, very important to um, 
to um, develop procedures to make users feel more comfortable. So even though these are all healthy grad students, it, it, yeah, they found it quite frightening to, um, to wear an exoskeleton. So um, we are developing procedure to really tell them how to, how to correctly stand up, how to um, get used to the actions the exoskeleton is doing for them to also um, yeah, increase their confidence and um, allow them. And we think for patients, it's, it's even more important. Um, we also think it's really important to um, have a lot of information and yeah, explain people exactly how to, um, how to put it on. And then also, um, so you see, you can put it on in, in parts and then also how to, um, yeah, how to stand up with it. So um, yeah, information is important, not just um, computations. Okay, then um, again here, the goal is to, um, to use um, model-based optimization, like also again, do a combined human plus exo model, bring it together with a lot of um, experiments of the human um, with instrumented crutches and also using a lot of sensors in the exoskeleton and then um, use that approach to improve the design and the control of it. Okay, um, yeah, so this is, from previous research. Okay, coming to the, the summary. Um, I think that you know, human center robots, so that with all their different um, versions there are, so including humanoid robots, variable robots, and assistive devices, they have a very high potential to improve people's lives. Um, it's um, important to endow them with uh, necessary motion intelligence or embodied intelligence, but that is also very challenging. Um, it requires motion, perception, and interaction capabilities. Um, we need um, really efficient algorithms for the design and control of human-centered robots. Um, we think that model-based approaches and especially model-based optimization is really good to take into account the physics of the system, but um, we find especially the combination with model-free approaches very promising. Um, we really require an interdisciplinary effort for um, doing that research, um, including biomechanics, control algorithms as discussed, but also, of course, the medical, psychological, ethical, and legal expertise are really important. And we also have them in, in quite a few projects. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, we are always looking for, for collaborations. And if any one of you is interested, we, yeah, we would be really happy to, to work with you and also share our robots and also the infrastructure that we have. So um, yeah, that's one last thing I wanted to say. Um, I also, um, we recently founded a new um, regional society chapter of the IEEE Robotics and Automation Society, as some of you may know, that are in that society in the region. So because you had um, yeah, also were asked if you wanted to confirm that. So um, that went through and it was just founded. Um, yeah, we are planning to start the activity soon. So if you're um, interested to participate and are not on the, on the list anyway, um, please, please get in touch. But with that, I'm really at the end, and I thank you very much for your attention. Great, yeah, thanks very much for the for the talk. Um, so, if you have a question for uh, Professor Mombar, you could either unmute and just ask a question. Okay, I see one hand up. Um, Abhinav, do you want to unmute and ask a question? Sorry, I didn't. I didn't hand up. Oh, you didn't mean to. Okay. <laughs> nice presentation, though. Thanks, Professor. Okay, maybe that was clapping. Maybe you're doing clapping. Yeah, it was a bloody. Yeah, there's another icon. Um, yeah, are there? So, so if, if you do have any questions, just, I mean, you can just unmute and, and ask. Um, I guess maybe while people are, thinking about their questions, I'll just ask, uh, ask one. So um, a, a lot of the, I guess I, what, maybe what I was trying to understand is, is to what extent you kind of compute motions versus like policies, you know? Um, and, and so like by policy, I mean some kind of like feedback control that's, that 
depends on the state of the human when you know to control the robot versus like a sequence of optimized motions for a given task i mean so, so we always um i mean you always optimize the motion as usually lots of model parameters what whatever like three parameters and also the input at, at the same time and the input could be like if i'm using an open loop model that could be the the torques or the forces i'm driving my model but i could also i can also formulate a a closed loop in my model and then that would um also include um yeah essentially the the feedback loop um and i could yeah then then i would um essentially um optimize the, the command I give to my feedback controllers. Um, and at the same time, I could also um, formulate the, the parameters of the controller as, you know, as free optimization parameters. And then I could also um, optimize them, which is also what we did in a couple of cases. Okay, okay. Yeah. And so like, yeah. what, what portion of that is solved offline versus online then, like prior to the execution versus while it's occurring? Yeah, I mean, as I um, like, like it depends a bit what um, what kind of model. So if it's um, so if it's really solving a full optimization, uh, maybe if I may add to your previous question. So so policy, I think in terms of policy, you could also um, you could also interpret these um, inverse optimal control things we are doing also as a kind of policy, that, and that's where we are trying to identify the policy we are seeing or um, we are essentially optimizing to find the optimization optimization criterion so so that's also in the direction of policy okay. um yeah but to your second question with the with the online offline thing um i, I would say if, if we are talking about really a model-based optimal control problem with um such a complex model as as a humanoid robot or a human with an exoskeleton that's always um offline that doesn't work online right. um, if i want to move it online i would have to um yeah come up with these combined methods and that would then involve solving yeah a lot of these problems offline and then having that um yeah other kind of parameterization of the the solution space that allows me to use it online and i mean as i i gave that one example of the for, for this coco mobile thing um where we um did it for a very challenging walking problem, and it, it we were really amazed how how well it worked, and um, we are yeah we are really optimistic it would also work for for other problems for um, yeah so we are also eager to to explore that and and that would then be working yeah, online so really as a as a controller. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Um... Maybe I'll ask just once more, any other questions from the audience? Okay, well, quite, <laughs> quiet audience today, but yeah, th thanks again for the talk. It was, it was really interesting and uh, we appreciate, yeah, getting your perspective and hearing about your research. So uh, yeah, thanks a lot for joining. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for attending. Okay. If any questions come up, you can also send me an email. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, well, um, I guess I will say.